So my name is Carla Casares. I'm the director of the School of Integrated Biology, and I'll be moderating this session. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Donald Ort. He's the Robert Emerson Professor of Plant Biology and Crop Sciences at Illinois and research leader of the USDA ARS Global Change and Photosynthesis Research Unit in Urbana. And today he's going to talk to us about more than taking the heat. Well, thank you very much, Carla, and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in this Congress. What I wanted to talk about today um, really relates to impacts that global climate change are going to have on food production in the world. And um, specifically, I like Caillou, I'm going to focus on food production um, in the Midwest. So as many of you know, um, UNFAO and other organizations have suggested that in order to meet agricultural demand by the middle of this century, we'll need to increase uh, global food production by as much as 70%. Um, and this is true also for the Corn Belt. In order to meet demand, um, we need to increase by at least 50 percent and, and probably 70 percent. And this is probably going to have to be done on, on globally shrinking uh, land acreage and also shrink shrinking acreage um, in the United States. And of course, it has to be done um, in the face of a variable climate and a somewhat uncertain climate. And so we've seen this uh, previously before, both last night and, and Don Wubles talked about it. And this is simply uh, a representation of what's happening to CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it's going up quite rapidly. Those black dots are um, actually the measurements up to 2013. And as you can see, it's following the most aggressive scenario. If we're only CO2 that we're going up in the atmosphere, you know, overall CO2 is good for plant growth. Um, it is the substrate for photosynthesis, as we learned from Kyo. It also has an effect on water use efficiency in plants. But as we know, CO2 and the other forcing gases are called greenhouse gases, and they're called forcing gases because um, they're leading to warming. Um, and they're leading to warming um, that's already occurred. And so what you can see on, on this slide is that black line is um, the actual measurement of global warming that's occurred, normalized to um, uh, 1950. And I think the major take home lesson I'd like you to have um, from this slide is simply that when we talk about the change in average temperature of the globe, we tend to underestimate what the change is going to be in the areas where we actually grow crops. And so the, the amount of warming that we're getting over the land areas, over the terrestrial areas, is significantly more than, the, than what we're getting um, over the ocean and, and, of course, then average globally. And certainly, um, we can anticipate that the warming that's already occurred due to these forcing gases is going to continue. Um, again, here we're looking at uh, the projections of the most aggressive scenario that we're currently on um, and the, I think, uh, overly aspirational scenario of, of 2.6 that we may have already passed. Um, you can see that the global average in temperature predicted for 2100 um, is on the order of about 4 degrees. And again, this is the global average, and so we can expect in many of our growing areas that the temperature change is going to be greater than that. And so when we think about uh, growing a crop in a warmer environment, you know, it really, it really changes the physics about being a leaf. And so, you know, LEAF is all about trying to capture CO2 that's diluted in the atmosphere um, from an atmosphere that's very much drier than the atmosphere that's within the LEAF. And so, um, and so the, the amount of water that it has to give up to capture CO2 has a lot to do with what the temperature is. Um, and that's driven by this, and, and Don Wobles mentioned it, and this is just the saturation vapor pressure um, compared to, to air temperature. And so what this means, if you're a soybean leaf at about 20 degrees, and you're giving up, say, 100 molecules of water for every molecule of CO2 you're taking up, if now you have to do that at 30 degrees, that amount of water that you're giving up to take up that CO2 can balloon to 1,000. And so this is that exponential relationship of the, the water holding capacity of the atmosphere. So it can hold more water and actually be drier and the transpirational demand on that leaf can actually go up. And so th this is a real, this is a real um, issue going forward in thinking about 
um, is there a water ceiling in terms of rain-fed agriculture in the Corn Belt? And so Caillou introduced what the vapor pressure deficit is. And so the vapor pressure deficit really is comparing the humidity or the uh, amount of water that's in the atmosphere within the leaf to the amount of water that's in the atmosphere outside the leaf. And that difference, it's always, it's essentially 100% relative humidity within the leaf and something lower than that outside the leaf. So even if there's the same temperature, that's what drives the loss of water from the leaf. And so the higher that temperature gets, the higher the vapor pressure deficit gets. And so we saw on a previous slide that there, you know, that there has been significant warming um, uh, over the last uh, two or three or four decades. And what's shown here is um, uh, data from David LaBelle's paper that was referred to earlier. And it just maps what's happened to vapor pressure deficit as a function of year from 1995 to 2012. And you can see that there's a lot of scatter in the points. This isn't scattered due to imprecision in measurements. This is actual in interannual variability in the vapor pressure deficit that you get in different times. And so this is for the eastern growing region of, of the U.S. Corn Belt. Beyond 2012, that's model data. And so that the black line is the average about uh, 19 or 20 uh, different circulation models um, projecting what the vapor pressure deficit will be going forward. And that, and that blue shaded area is the 25% to 75% level of confidence. And so what it suggests is that the average vapor pressure deficit um, that we're experiencing now is about 2.2 kilopascals and will become 2.65 by the middle of this century. Clearly there's some imprecision in those numbers, but the trend is pretty clear. And so we can begin to ask the question, you know, what does that mean for growing a maize crop um, in Illinois or Indiana or in Iowa. And so if you look at water use efficiency, and so water use efficiency is defined as the amount of CO2 that you can, that a plant reduces to the level of carbohydrate or the level of biomass for the amount of water that it's lost. And so um, as water use efficiency um, and, and so water use efficiency is very dependent on what the vapor pressure deficit is. And so if you look at a maize crop interannually, or if you look at a maize crop grown in different areas, you can get hugely different numbers for water use efficiency. But that can be normalized to what the vapor pressure deficit is. And when that's done, you can see that if we look over here at the C4 crops, maize being the lowest one, that all of these C4 crops, all of these crops that have uh, C4 photosynthetic metabolism, have a pretty similar vapor pressure deficit um, in the units given here, of somewhere around 0.1. C3 crops, on the other hand, that don't have this CO2 concentrating mechanism and therefore give up a lot more water to take up a CO2 molecule, um, they're a lot less efficient. So a soybean is about half as water use efficient as a maize plant. But again, you can see that there's uniformity across that m photosynthetic metabolism and what the water use efficiency is. And so can, can from that information, we figure out um, how much corn we can grow in 2050 versus what we can grow now based on the rainfall that we get. And so we've attempted to do that. And so for corn at a vapor pressure deficit of one kilopascal, using these vapor pressure deficit corrected um, water use efficiency, for maize it permits about 20 bushels per acre per inch of water assuming that half of the above ground biomass is grain, you know, which is very close to, to what's measured. And so when we do that, um, we, we can plot yield either in bushels per acre or, or tons per hectare, depending what country you're from. Um, and, and so this is plotted for what the current vapor pressure deficit is a 2.2. And what you can see is that um, at uh, at average rainfall, which for this area is about 37 inches per year, that can support up to 200 and, um, 230 bushels of corn per acre. And so that's plenty of rain in an average year to support the average 165 bushels per acre that we get. However, if you go out to this line that says yield required for 2050, and so that's adding on this yield increase that we think that we need to meet agricultural demand in 2050, you see even at current vapor pressure deficits 
um, we're not able to do that. And so we've already hit that water ceiling in an average year. So what happens if we do the same kind of calculation for 2050 when vapor pressure deficit has gone from 2.2 to 2.65? And so what we find now is that um, what we find now is, yes, we can still support about 175 bushels per acre. So in an average year, it means we can still support what the current yield is. But notice now that um, in, uh, at 2.2, we don't become water limited until we have rainfalls lower than 25 inches per year. Now in 2050, it suggests that we will have drops in yield when we have rainfalls less than, than 30 inches per year. And so the crop becomes much more susceptible to, um, to drought because the whole area of, of what a drought is has shifted. Now, Caillou brought up the point that, um, in fact, elevated CO2 has an effect other than fertilizing photosynthesis in C3 plants. It all also affects evapotranspiration and water use efficiency. And so these were measurements that were uh, taken here out at, at, out at Soyface growing both corn and soybean at, um, el at control CO2 levels, which are today are about 400 parts per million, and elevated CO2 levels that at this facility we can raise the CO2 concentration um, over the crop to, to 600 parts per million. And what you can see is that um, the way plants respond to that, whether they're C3 or C4, is they close these stomates a bit. Now they can get the CO2 that they need and not lose as much water doing it. And so if we take into this, this effect of elevated CO2 on maize, um, it mitigates to some extent. And so if we look at the red line here, um, that's factoring in both the higher vapor pressure deficit and this water saving component of the elevated CO2. And so what you can see is that these two put together, um, at least in this model, suggests that it doesn't fully restore uh, the yield that we would expect or the yield capacity that we have. Um, but I think one of the take-home messages here is that, um, is that even in order to sustain yields that we have now, much less thinking about increasing them by 50 percent, we're going to have to do something about water use efficiency in these crops um, if it's going to maintain these kinds of yields and if we're going to be able to do it in rain-fed agriculture. And so there was another interesting thing in the Lobel paper. Um, and so they used this data set that Caillou had, talk, had talked about out of the USDA uh, risk management um, uh, group. And, and so there are years where the vapor pressure deficit is really big. You know, it's, it's bigger than 2.65. It's, you know, it's 3 or, you know, or even 3.5. And what they noticed from this data set when they analyzed it was, once the vapor pressure deficit got about two, above about 2.65, there's really a precipitous change in the slope of yield loss that are associated with that. And so this suggests that this is a process, you know, other than what we've just talked about, other than the process of losing water through stomates due to increased vapor pressure deficit, it's suggesting that there's another effect of vapor pressure deficit, for instance, on, uh, you know, drying out reproductive structures. And so we were interested in beginning to look at these, beginning to uh, find out what are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about um, in terms of adaptation in maize and adaptation in some of these other crops. And so we set out to do uh, a warming experiment. In this case, we're doing canopy warming um, in maize. This work was done in collaboration with Carl Bernacchi's lab, and the research was led by Ursula Ruz Vera and uh, Matt Siebers, who were graduate students in our lab at the time that we did this. And so uh, what Carl has built here is an array of infrared heaters that, that is under careful control and so that we can raise the, the temperature of the canopy um, to however much we want, um, you know, within some limits, um, and, um, and do that for either the entire growing seasons or short periods within the growing season. This isn't exactly like what's going to happen in global climate change where the temperature of the air is going to go up, but it is the best mimic that can be uh, executed under a field environment. And so the experiment that we wanted to do or the experiment I'm going to talk to you about today was really a, a heat wave experiment where we were giving 
uh, short, fairly high temperature increases. And so this is interesting for two from two standpoints. You know, Don told us that the frequency and the severity of heat waves is going to go up, and so it would be very useful to begin to quantify what those effects might be. And then secondly, by giving these heat waves at different times during the development of a crop, we can begin to diagnose um, what are the potential uh, sensitive processes and most sensitive processes that give rise um, to the changes in yield and the changes in biomass that we might see. And you can see our hypothesis is, um, you know, this notion that uh, this drop, that with this precipitous change that we see in the slope of the yield loss versus VPD above 2.65 may be due to direct effects of vapor pressure deficit and the associated temperature change on reproductive structures. And so this just shows uh, the profile of the heat wave, and so we wanted to do heat wave um, in two different situations, two different vegetative stages. One is the vegetative stage called uh, V7, and so this is when the corn plants are, you know, on the order of 18 inches high. It's when they're going into exponential growth, and it's, you know, it's when they really go into stem elongation. And so they're not reproductive at all. Um, however, it is, it is about that time that uh, row number and even kernel number are being, uh, you know, laid down in the, in the memory of the plant um, in terms of, of what they're going to be able to produce at the end of the season. And then we also wanted to look at R1, and so R1 is when uh, the corn is silking, and this is one of the most uh, sensitive times uh, of the corn plant or the maize plant to environmental factors. And so heat wave one, uh, WV1 then was during the vegetative stage, WV2 was during, was during the reproductive stage, and you can see in the dark circles that's the control canopy temperature and then uh, the light gray circles are the elevated temperature. And so this is a, uh, these are three-day heating events. We're raising the temperature six degrees centigrade over what the ambient is. And you can see the diurnal changes in temperatures you would expect. And so what we found is that um, heat wave given during um, either the vegetative uh, or the reproductive stage um, had no discernible effect on vegetative biomass. And so the total amount of vegetative biomass stayed the same. There was no statistical difference. However, um, when, we, when we gave the heat wave, um, heat wave two during the reproductive, you can see that, that heat wave one um, diminishes as its sum. Those numbers there are just the p-values from the ANOVA. Um, and so that p-value, while not significant, certainly suggests that there um, is, a, is a trend toward uh, lower yields. And in heat wave, heat wave two that was given uh, during R1, um, we do see a statistically significant drop in yield. And that drop in yield is um, on the order of about uh, 15%. And so this is just a three-day event uh, during a sensitive reproductive stage. Um, and so this certainly is an experimental demonstration of things that um, you know many farmers have known for a very long time, um, but it also suggests that um, with more statistical power, we may even see an effect of a heat wave during a vegetative stage that uh, translates through all the way to yield. And so, interestingly, the heat waves had no effect on um, either the vegetative or uh, the reproductive uh, phenology. And so what you can see here on, the, on the, uh, the left part of the graph, well, I guess it depends where you're sitting, the upper graph, um, as it goes through the various V stages up to V17, there's no effect between control heat wave one and heat wave two and the same, the lower part um, as it's going through the various R stages from R1 to R5. And so you might anticipate that, um, because we've added heating degree days uh, to this crop, you know, during this heat wave, that it might have advanced phenology, but if it did, uh, it didn't do it enough for us to resolve it in this experiment. I mean, then finally, I just wanted to, you know, I've I've made this point that as temperature goes up, vapor pressure deficit goes up, and water use goes up, and what these data show is that even for this three-day heat wave, there is an effect on evapotranspiration. Um, that is discernible um, and actually changes the uh, total evapotranspiration for the entire month. And so you can see in the month of June when, when we gave the first heat wave, 
uh, the total evaporation went from uh, 72 millimeters up to 81. And in July, it went from 199 to 2004. And, and so um, these increases in temperature uh, do change the evapotranspiration and the water use. We've also done experiments with maize and with soybeans where we do full season heating. Typically, we do those at three and a half degrees um, rather than six degrees because it's, you know, it's, it's a more realistic change and it mimics what we expect you know, um, by mid-century. And in those cases, we see very large changes in the evapotranspiration. You know, and that becomes a difficult covariant in our experiment because uh, now we're depleting soil moisture much more quickly. And um, you know, if we don't add it back, then we may be looking at a water limitation at the same time we're looking at these temperature effects. So these become quite uh, complicated experiments to do the right controls on and to interpret. And so I just wanted to end um, and, you know, and to delineate what adaptation priorities for improving maize yields um, in a warming future would be. And so the first is, you know, in that area below uh, 2.65 kilopascals, um, it's really improved water use efficiency um, that we need to counteract for this increase in VPD that results in an increase in water use. Um, the alternative to that is, you know, most of the Corn Belt is rain-fed agriculture at this time. If we can't improve water use efficiency, then the alternative, you know, presumably is either to take lower yields um, or to convert this into irrigated land, which um, is, is, since this is a sustainability conference, um, I don't think that's going to be a sustainable option. In this, higher, in this higher range of VPD that we might expect after 2050, um, then I think the priorities turn to um, priorities of making the reproductive structures and the reproductive processes more, um, more resilient. And so both, both of these things, particularly the first one, are things that uh, we're working on um, here at the University of Illinois um, in this area of, of improved water use efficiency. Uh, we have a grant from DOE that's being read, led by um, Andrew Leakey, you know, where we're looking at opportunities in C4 plants of, of how can you increase um, water use efficiency. And just to give you a little bit of insight into um, how we might be able to do that, um, you know, CO2 has gone up in the atmosphere. It's gone up from, you know, pre-revolution, pre-industrial pre revolution 150 years ago um, from about 270 up to 400 now. Um, and so uh, in a C4 plant, because they have a CO2 pump, photosynthesis was already saturated, was already saturated with CO2 at 250 parts per million. Now it's way oversaturated. And so there's the option of manipulating stomatal number or stomatal size to bring that CO2 back down um, to where it's just saturated. And in doing so, you would increase water use efficiency. So I think um, at time, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Don. And again, we'll have a panel discussion at the end with all the questions. All right, so next it's my pleasure to introduce Maximilian Ophammer, who is the George Hardy Junior Professor of International Sustainable Development Associate Dean in the Division of Social Sciences at Berkeley. And he's gonna to talk to us today about regional crop diversity and weather shocks in India. I'm gonna try and stick to my 20 minutes here, even though I like to hear myself talk very much. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for, for inviting me, uh, Madhu, and the organizers of this, uh, this conference. I also want to apologize to Amy, who did a fabulous job organizing this conference, for not responding to any emails. It's, I'm, I'm bad. Uh, my name is uh, Max Alfhammer. I am what the graduate students refer to as a, a regression monkey. So uh, what I do is I look at observational data. I use statistical models to look for patterns in, in data. It's just another way of answering questions that everybody here is, is interested in, not from a crop modeling or from a field experiment type approach, but just looking at, at observational uh, 
data. So uh, why did I get into this? A long time ago, uh, when I was a, a graduate student, I worked with Ram uh, down at UCSD and Jeff Vincent, who's now at, at Duke, looking at rice yields uh, in India. So what you've got here is the output of rain-fed rice or, or rice grown in rain-fed states uh, in India from 1965 to 2005. And what you're probably all well aware of, but what was news to me at the time, is that yield growth had sort of slowed down and leveled off at that point in time. What you can see beautifully in here is just the wonder of the, the Green Revolution that really just uh, exploded uh, yield growth. Uh, so we're going to pick up from there a little bit. Uh, when you see a picture like this, you always wonder, is this just the, the one crop for the area I'm looking at, or is this broader than that? So yesterday on my, my flight here, uh, where United's internet connection worked for exactly 16 minutes, but that was enough to get this. Uh, I looked at the most recent FAO uh, statistics, just breaking down uh, yield growth by area. So you've got Asia, China, India, and, and world for three periods, uh, 1960s and 70s, 80s, 90s, and the most recent 15-year period. And what you're seeing is that growth rates, so this is average annual yield growth rates, we all know how those work, but uh, are, are decreasing across uh, the, the board. Is this just rice? If we look at yields for different crops, we're seeing similar pictures. So whenever grad students show me time series of anything and ask me to read growth rates off of time series, I start yelling at them. I say, why don't you just plot the growth rates directly? So here you go. Uh, so you've got wheat, uh, maize, and soy here. And what we're seeing here is not monotonic everywhere, uh, but we're seeing patterns that these growth rates are uh, slowing down somewhat. Now, I'm not going to stand here and, and say, you know, this is just climate change and nothing else matters. Uh, any uh, agricultural economist or anybody who's worked on, on crops before, of course, realizes that there's lots of other things uh, going on. If you're thinking about sort of diminishing <laughs> marginal product of, of uh, fertilizers, pesticides, you know, maybe we've sort of uh, starting to see some diminishing marginal returns to crop innovation, but there are other people who can much more intelligently comment on this. But one th question we do want to ask is, is observed climate change maybe part of this uh, particular story? And if so, is what are the options at a very much macro scale? So I'm not interested in, in farm level questions today. I'm going to look very much at a sort of macro scale, uh, very similar to the scale that Tom was talking about earlier in his uh, best practice talk over here. It's always tough following Tom on a podium. All right. So if we go back to the uh, I'm getting confused with assessment. I think we're doing the sixth assessment report next, and the last one we were on was the fifth one. Uh, but if you look back at uh, observed climate change impacts on agriculture, uh, we're trying to detect the fingerprint of climate change on yields. Uh, what you're doing when you're doing this is you're detecting the fingerprints of David Lobel on everything. I think he was mentioned in every single presentation this morning. But uh, what we're seeing here is that if you split it up by crop, whether studies account for CO2 fertilization uh, or not, whether you use a statistical model or a process model, uh, whether it's tropical or temperate uh, zones we're looking at here, on average we're seeing a contribution of observed climate change which seem to have slowed down uh, uh, yield, uh, yield growth. All right, so this is observed looking back. Uh, so if you've ever been part of the IPCC, the good work gets done over <coughs> coffee and cream cake. So you stand at, at somewhere with a cappuccino somewhere in the world and you start talking. Uh, so David Lobel again came up and said, you know, we're always looking at yields, but can we sort of look at events and prices? So this is a very nice figure uh, in the fifth assessment report right here that just looks at major climate or, or weather events right here and tries to tease out whether those are consistent uh, with price spikes. And you're seeing here, again, this is not some sort of regression result here, but you can see for a lot, a lot of the, the crop-relevant extreme event here, uh, they've been uh, 
preceded by a, sorry, that they've been, climate relevant extremes here have been followed by price spikes. Now, if you've read Brian Wright's collected works, storage here plays a huge role, how full storage is or, or how empty it is. But just looking at yields as part of the story, prices, of course, is the, the other important aspect here. So the past is beautiful. It's easier to study than the future always. Uh, so if we look forward and we do these prospective studies, then trying to determine you know, what are the impacts of adaptation on climate change? Are that, That's the sort of million dollar uh, question. Economists are sometimes a little bit snippish about agriculture. It's just 2% of, of world GDP. It's 100% of the calories we and our pets eat. So I, I would argue it's an economically important sector and GDP is maybe the wrong indicator in terms of measuring its importance. But if we're looking at a lot of the prospective studies out, studies that do this with adaptation, without adaptation, uh, we're seeing significant negative projected impacts on, on yields uh, across the board. Not all studies agree, uh, but on average, uh, we're seeing negative impacts. And I'm gonna just mirror something that Tom said earlier, uh, the fund integrated assessment model that models the impacts of climate change and then gets translated into the social cost of carbon. It was one of three models used in the U.S. calculation of the social cost of carbon. Basically says that climate change is beneficial up to almost four degrees in its, its damage function, which we know isn't uh, right. So this type of work here is keenly uh, important. Now when we think about adaptation, I tried to put this into a couple of different buckets here. When we sit back and, and, and put on our adaptation hat, which is empirically very hard to do, I think you can sort of separate adaptation strategies into two buckets. One are these crop-specific solutions, and one, the other set are these what I like to call holistic uh, solutions. So if you're trying to figure out how does your favorite crop do in a world of climate change, so you're narrowing the, the spectrum of what you're looking at, just corn or just rice or just soy or just cotton, you can think about, you know, going forward, we already heard, maybe we should put an irrigation to, you know, maintain yield growth in, in, in maize. Uh, so that's one strategy right here. We could think about developing new varieties that are better able to withstand extreme heat events, make corn even shorter, or we could simply th think about shifting planting schedules, plant earlier in the year or later in the year, depending on where you are uh, on the globe. The, I think, better way of thinking about this is take a step back and instead of being stuck in corn land, right, is think about uh, holistic solutions. So as we go forward, maybe the land where we're currently growing one crop with a new climate and new sort of precipitation and temperature and vapor pressure, vapor pressure deficit patterns uh, is better suited to growing another crop. So switching crops from one uh, crop to another or maybe going from crops to uh, you know pasture or retiring some land is one way of, of going forward. Uh, Canada is obviously uh, hoping that uh, in, in Northern Europe, too, that as it gets warmer there, uh, that some of what gets grown here now uh, migrates north, so maybe we could farm land that's previously unfarmed. So thinking in a much more uh, holistic way. Now, another avenue of adaptation to extreme uh, weather events uh, came out of the ecology literature, and there's a bunch of economists who've, who've worked on this, too, but there is this basic notion that increased diversification leads to more resilient uh, systems, right? So when you put in your retirement portfolio, you're not going to bet your retirement on Apple. You're going to, you know, diversify uh, your risk. So the argument that's been made by ecologists is that if you have droughts or heat waves and you have a more diversified landscapes, the yield impacts are likely going to be lower in diversified uh, landscapes rather than uh, mon uh, monocultures. Uh, if you talk to ecologists, I'm sure many of you are in the room here, and I'm <laughs> simplifying this quite a bit, it's not about necessarily you know, what share in a big landscape goes to which crop, but how you actually arrange individual parcels really uh, matters, and also when you plant what uh, matters. 
One of the mechanisms that's been proposed is simply that the sensitivity to pests is lowered in more diversified uh, landscapes. Now there is quite a few papers that look at more diverse farming systems. Uh, most of them look at very limited areas over limited uh, amounts of time and mostly look at yield. So what I'm going to try and do here very humbly, I'm not pretending that I'm revolutionizing the world of climate impacts uh, research here, is to simply look at uh, a period of time in an area where we've seen a big change in diversification of, of agriculture and seeing if at the macro scale we can see whether uh, that particular region uh, has better outcomes in, in drought or, or low water years than in high uh, water years. So that's the, the basic idea here. So how are we going to do this? Uh, we're going to look at India and we're going to look at the third quarter uh, of the last uh, century, which of course is one of the most important quarters in, in, in agronomic history, uh, time around the, the Green uh, Revolution. And what I'm going to show you here is some very preliminary evidence. This is, these regressions are maybe a month old uh, and we haven't done much more on them yet, so I'm waiting for you to yell at me and tell me how we can do better, and then you know the paper is going to be much better. But our preliminary an uh, answer here is that we indeed do find some measurable uh, effects, benefits uh, from more uh, diversified uh, systems. So how are we going to do this? This is the famed India Agriculture and Climate data set that came out of, or was funded by the World Bank. Uh, it gets us data at the district level. Uh, we're limiting ourselves to the original data set here, which gives you a, a variety of, of yield outcomes, prices, fertilizer use, labor, and so on, uh, covers the years 1956 to 1987. This data set has been expanded by Esther Duflo and Rohini Pandey. Uh, we're not using the extension of that data set because it limits itself to just the major crops, and we want to look at, at all crops here. So the beautiful thing about this data set is, A, I don't have to go out into the field and wait for 30 years to get a data set, but it's there and it covers one of the big important uh, time periods in, uh, in agriculture. So there were a, a, a couple of papers that uh, Jeff, uh, Ram, and I have written that have looked at just rice agriculture and looking at the effects of and timing of weather and the growth phase of the, the rice plant. Uh, we've looked at patterns of rainfall. Uh, we've looked at timing of temperature, timing of rainfall, whether you have irrigation and high yielding varieties, and done this in India. Uh, at the state level. There was a paper in PNAS, one in climatic change, and there was another one somewhere else, which right now in my time crunch here, I can't remember where we published it, but it was published somewhere. Uh, so just limiting at rice, and what we're showing here is that patterns of rainfall uh, really matter. Uh, more intense periods, sort of one, two day periods where a lot of rain comes down, followed by a longer dry spell is really not good uh, for rice plants. And of course, weaker monsoon years are consistent with lower rice yields as well. So we're building on this 2012 paper in climatic change where we're using a very similar regression, uh, regression specification here, but we're now going to consider uh, all crops grown uh, in India during this time period. So I apologize, I, I, you know, at these bigger interdisciplinary events, you're not supposed to put up uh, big math, but this is simple math. Uh, it's just a sum, right? So what I've got here is I'm going to have revenue per hectare on the left-hand side. I'm going to control for unobservable differences across districts, shocks that all districts uh, experience at the same, uh, in the same year. And then what I'm going to control for is the sort of usual suspects, temperature in a, in a growing season, precipitation in a growing season, the share of irrigation, share of high yielding varieties, and I'm going to control for, for labor. The cool thing about this particular paper is here, I'm going to look at the impact of droughts, but I'm going to interact it with a measure of how diverse the uh, farming uh, system is. So. What do you mean uh, by diversity here? I'm going to calculate a hirschman herfindahl index that simply looks at the share of area planted to 20 different uh, crops. So how do you calculate that? 
you look at these major and minor crops here, so this is not just soy, wheat, cotton, and, and, and uh, I'm leaving one out, and rice, but this is really all the major crops grown here. We're just going to look at the share of area planted in a given year uh, in terms of total area planted in a district, uh, square that share, and <coughs> sum it across crops, and that gets you a number between 0 and 1. If you have a completely homogeneous landscape, it's, it's one, and the lower the number is, the more fractionalized or diverse the, the farming system uh, is. So what's the, the underlying source of, of variation here? Right? You could think about doing this in a, in a snapshot in time, which statistically speaking is problematic because different districts are different for multiple reasons. So what you want here is you want change in a given district over a long period of time in the diversity of its farming system or its crops. And this is where the Green Revolution comes in very nicely. Uh, Northern India experienced a drastic and very rapid rollout of Green Revolution crops, which uh, displaced a, a number of, of other crops. So what you're seeing here is from 1955 to 1985, this is northern India right here, a rapid increase in this measure of, of diversity. So over time, northern India became much less uh, diverse. The data from this data set in southern India suggests that that trend wasn't quite there uh, in southern India. So there's a nice uh, source of, of time series uh, variation here in a trend towards less uh, diversity in the north. Is this really uh, high yielding varieties? If you plot our measure of diversity against uh, the share of high yielding varieties, you get this nice positive uh, relationship here. So this is essentially high yielding varieties uh, taking uh, a large amount of, taking up a larger amount of, of land right here. So here comes the regression table. Thanks, Max, for putting up eight point font that I can't read, but let me walk you through the important number right here. So this is just a regression. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have net revenues. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you have yields. So you've got two columns. There's separate uh, regressions here. One tells you uh, total amount of, of rupees per acre or hectare taken in. The right one is just pounds per hectare, and we're aggregating across crops here. So yield in this regression is sort of an iffy measure because a pound of rice is very different from a pound of, of, of groundnut, for example. But what we're seeing here is that this interaction term of, of diversity is negative and significant in both of these uh, regressions here, which is consistent with what you might think of before. What this argues is that if you get a, a roughly a one standard deviation increase in, uh, in the uh, monoculture measure here, or lower diversity uh, by a standard deviation, gives you roughly a 10% uh, worse response to a, a drought compared to a uh, relatively more diverse system. So this is captured both in net revenues and in yields. So a lot of the other papers have done this for yields, and they're finding these types of effects here. But what we're adding here is larger scale, larger time period, and we're looking at, at net revenues as well. So this is pooled across the entire country. You might argue, well, this measure of diversity at the same time, is that really the right measure? Maybe it's last period's diversity. If we include that, you get the same uh, results. Is it just the north? If we do this in the north, you get essentially identical uh, results. How about the south? Also very similar uh, results. We just have a lot more uh, variation in the north than in the south to identify the, the statistical uh, effect here. So I have three seconds. I'm going to go over by about a minute and a half. I apologize. If we <coughs> do this separately for a price index, where we calculate a price index across all crops, so we're going to see if there's a, a price response here uh, that's differential uh, price response to a drought that's differential for more and less diverse uh, farming systems. Uh, this is the, the price index right here. What you want to look at here is this column right here. Uh, and across the board, all India, north and to a certain degree in the south, we're seeing a very, very small 
positive uh, price effect. So what this means is that um, more, uh, sorry, less diverse uh, districts are going to experience a slight increase in prices, slightly higher increase in prices uh, due to the drought uh, compared to their uh, more diverse counterparts. All right, so uh, almost you know, 21 minutes, that's not bad. Uh, so what we're finding here is suggestive evidence, and the word suggestive here is important. I am going to not be casual about the word causal, all right? This is not causal, but it is a correlation here that I find very interesting, that there is an impact on, on net revenues and prices. The impact on net revenues is economically and statistically significant. The price channel seems to be uh, relatively small. All right, so thank you for listening. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, my friend Amy, who's going to follow me on the podium. And I, I, I would be amiss if I wouldn't point out that that's uh, the only woman giving a paper in, in, in two days of papers. So I, I think we can do better in the future. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, great. And so finally, for this session, it's my pleasure to introduce Amy Andu, who's Professor of Agriculture and Consumer Economics here at Illinois, and she's going to tell us about conservation planning in the face of climate change. Thank you so much, and it's uh, it's difficult to follow Max. I'm not as tall, um, but actually, I'm also going to be talking about diversification, so that was lucky. Um, uh, and let me point out that the research that I'm going to be talking about is uh, contributed to by a host of many great people, uh, some here at the University of Illinois, Jen Friderigos and Enres, Minnie Mallory's in my department, Aparna and Sam are graduate students in, in those two departments, Glenn Gutensbergen's at, at USGS, and Jennifer Olker is at NRRI in Duluth. Okay, fortunately, I don't need to spend a lot of time on these introductory things. I hope you were here in the morning to be really depressed by Don Wobel's update on just how grim it is. Don, I can't wait till that gets released so I can update my slides um, on the new evidence of how bad things are. Climate change is happening. It's probably worse than we thought it was going to be. However, we know something's going to happen, but it's uncertain in magnitude. It depends on human behavior. It depends, you know, there are still things we're learning about the way that climate responds to carbon emissions. And then even for a given uh, scenario of global warming, it's difficult to tell what the spatial distribution of effects will be. Where are things going to be? So these are two different models of climate change that yield very different predictions of where ecosystems of different kinds are going to be in the future. Well, if you are a conservationist, and I'm going to be talking about land conservation as an example, but really the tools that I describe could be used to apply to lots of other decision-making processes. If you want to protect prairie pothole land, you know, wa waterfowl uh, uh, habitat, you might look at this and say, wow, this looks great. This is perfect for, for ducks. It is perfect for ducks. And so you protect a whole bunch of this land, and you think you've done a good thing, and then it looks like this. That's not good. That's really not good for ducks. And if that's what all your protected area was, then you have lost. You know, suppose you're interested in piping plovers, and there might be this particular chain of, of barrier islands that is perfect piping plover, uh, piping plover habitat. There we go, uh, and so you've protected that, and that looks great. And then it just so happens that this is one of the areas where where you know patterns of sea level rise happen to hit hard, and it's all inundated. We, we've been talking about resilience. Don said climate change means we need a paradigm shift. We need to think about managing risk. Um, uh, Max talked about diversification. So what, what can we do about this? E ecologists have been, have been thinking about this because it is, for them, this huge 800-pound gorilla. So they've been talking about corridors. OK, things are going to move. We need corridors for them to move, although you still need to know where they're going to move to. Um, 
we should protect more land. There's even conversation about assisted migration. Ecologists have talked about simple diversification. So instead of just protecting one area, let's protect lots of different areas and, and see how that turns out. Um, you also hear about robust decision making. Um, those, those are some useful approaches. Um, economists, though, have been thinking about decision making under uncertainty for decades, for a really, really long time. Um, we're not good at a lot of things, but this is something we're relatively good at. Um, and so there has been some research in economics uh, by us <laughs> about spatial conservation portfolio analysis. Um, and I'll, I'll describe in a little bit what that means. Um, it, we've applied it in single cases, but there wasn't any systematic evaluation of the performance of that tool. So what I'm going to be talking about is how useful is this tool in lots of different cases, and in what kinds of cases does it work best? Well, what's it? What is portfolio theory? Um, somebody said this already today, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And so Harry Markowitz uh, in 1952 had this pathbreaking paper back when you could have a pathbreaking paper with one author and a title of two words um, in finance, uh, showing us how to, you know, all of you who have retirement savings are using the work of Harry Markowitz. You, you know, you're choosing a mixture of assets for an investment portfolio so that you either, you can view the problem either way. You're maximizing the expected return for a given level of, of risk or you're minimizing uncertainty in your outcome for a given level of expected return. And the key always to this, if you've ever met with a financial planner and you said, you know what, my, my, my grandfather worked for this railroad and I really just want to invest in that railroad, they'll beat you up because that's a terrible strategy. It's ideal to diversify. And in particular, if you hold assets that have values that vary opposite each other, then even if one goes bad, the other will be good. And so you've got something, okay? So this exploitation of negative correlation is key to efficient diversification. That's why many people in their retirement savings have stocks and bonds, because stocks and bond, returns on stocks and bonds, when one is high, the other is low, and vice versa. Um, Okay, so what does portfolio anal analysis give you? It doesn't give you a single answer. Um, what it does is it, it tells you a set of portfolios. So a por portfolio is, you know, this much money in that stock, this much money in that stock, this much money in those bonds, and so forth. Many are efficient in terms of maximizing returns for a level of risk. So portfolio analysis gives you the set of efficient portfolios, and then you can look at them and go, oh, that one looks pretty good. I'll show you an example. There's always a trade-off, though, and I was thinking about this. In the previous session, there was some discussion of farmers, how farmers are always wanting to innovate to increase expected returns, expected yields on the crops. But they're not thinking about the fact that the basement's here, and so you, you're just increase, you're actually increasing your, your investment is increasing risk, uncertainty. So either it's great or wow, you know, yields are terrible. Um, in order to reduce uncertainty, you, you have to accept some m reduction in expected value. So if one particular asset has the highest expected future value, then in order to reduce risk, you've got to move some investment to an asset that's worth less on average but it's negatively correlated with that thing that's really good, okay? So it's, it's hedging for you, it's, it's diversifying for you. And so what you're gonna get is, is, is that curve. Um, so the riskiest bundle is that one off to the right. Highest expected return, but also the highest uncertainty. All your eggs are in that one basket. If you take some of the eggs and you move them into another asset, then you're reducing your uncertainty in the overall portfolio for some reduction in expected return, okay? So it's not the best thing in expected return, but you are reducing your risk. And so you can look at this, uh, this set of portfolios and decide where you wanna be. Okay. Depends on how risk averse you are. Okay, so we have done, we, we published a paper in PNES where we did that for the prairie pothole region, and it worked pretty well. Um, 
but but then I got to well, you know, to be honest, we we use data for the Prairie Pothole region in order to because I had talked to Glenn who did that ecological research and the way he described it I thought wow that's a great application of portfolio theory well what about all the other problems are there other situations where this might not work so this whole team that I showed you on the on the first slide we've got data on 26 different kinds of conservation problems and I'll, I'll show you roughly what they are um, and so we, we've analyzed them, and what we're doing is we're going to quantify features of the problems, like how would you describe this kind of conservation problem. Um, in particular, we're going to be looking at how, how exceptional that best asset is, and, and here an asset is an area in the landscape that you might protect. Is it really great and all the rest are terrible, or is it the kind of bird or salamander or whatever that can you know, do pretty well in lots of places? We're going to be characterizing how common negative correlations are across space. And we're going to be looking for safe bets, for places that just don't have that much uncertainty at all. And then we're going to do the portfolio analyses, and we're going to quantify measures of how well they work, rather than just looking at it and going, oh, that looks pretty good. Um, we'll come up with some metrics that you can use to define performance. And we're going to look for patterns between features of the problems and how well portfolio analysis works to reduce uncertainty. Okay. Okay. Oh, goodness, math, boring. Um, I, I just described this, right? So exceptionalism, negative correlations, low risk options. Um, eh, we didn't need to talk about that, but this is cool. This is what uh, this is what a, 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 an efficient frontier looks like. The measures of success. So edge, the edge elasticity. The flatter the curve is, the better you are, right? If that curve is flat, then you can move from the risky point over without losing very much expected return, right? I'm so glad Don's nodding. That makes me happy because it's, you know, a lot of people, it's hard to explain um, portfolio theory. Um, so we're, we're going to measure that in a unit-free way with an elasticity. So it's the percentage change in expected return divided by the percentage change in standard deviation, okay? Um, and we'll measure that at that point A at the very edge, and then we'll measure it over the arc from A to C. So if you really wanted to do a big reduction in uncertainty, how much, what percentage loss and expected return do you have to accept in order to get that percentage reduction in risk? Then we're also going to think about, all right, well, so to do portfolio analysis, you need a computer, you need somebody who can use MATLAB or R. I think I might have seen a Perna walk in. Yes, there she is. You need a Perna to help you run the, run the because I don't actually know how to do this. She does all the work. Um, you, it, it's, it's not super easy. So what if you just said, I'm going to divide the landscape up evenly and I'm going to have an equal, I'm just going to divide it evenly among the different parts. That's easy. How well does that work? So that's point S. It's not going to be efficient, probably, but how inefficient? If it's not that bad, then what the heck, just do it, right? I'm sorry, Aparna, then you'd be out of a job. I'd be out of a job. But I think we need to be open to the possibility that easy methods are not that bad. So we're going we're gonna to explore that. OK, I'm not going to tell you about all the problems in great detail, but these are the three areas we're looking at. So one's the prairie pothole region. Um, so we've divided that area up into 24 subregions. We have data on 71 climate scenarios and three different goals, protecting waterfowl, protecting a measure of amphibian habitat called hydroperiod and protecting a, well, trying to get good levels of a different measure of amph amphibian habitat called spring inundation. Hence the frog, a northern crawfish frog. We've also got data on birds of the eastern United States. So here we've divided the whole eastern United States into seven different ecoregions. We have eight climate scenarios. And we're going to be looking at 16 different conservation objectives. One is all of the birds. One is all of the birds of IUCN concern. And then we're going to individually analyze 14 birds that are themselves of concern, conservation concern. And there we have a bobwhite quail and a common loon. 
And then finally, salamanders, which were fun and difficult because while birds can fly, salamanders can't. And so in order to decide where they would be in the future, um, Jen and Sam looked both at where the habitat would be good, but also how far they could crawl from where they currently are. So it was a little bit complicated. Um, so here we've divided the Appalachian Mountains up into 11 ecoregions. We have 12 climate scenarios and seven different sets of salamanders. They're in bad shape, by the way. Things don't look good for the salamanders. OK, so we have about five minutes, maybe? OK. So what are the problems like? They're highly varied, which is good. The whole point of doing this paper was that we wanted to look at lots of different kinds of problems so that we could see when this tool would work well for, for reducing uncertainty and total uh, conservation outcomes. So um, these things. Those things are the the measures of exceptionalism, like how much better is the first is is the best part of the landscape than all the rest. And so um, that's that's a that's a percentage. And so it's it ranges from like boy it just doesn't matter to wow it, you know the the next one is is uh, seventy percent lower. Um, we have a lot of variation in uh, how in the percentage of correlations that are negative. So some of the problems don't have any negative correlations and some of them have quite a few. And um, that those last things, those measures are capturing the presence. Uh, coefficient of variation is the, the standard deviation div divided by the mean. Okay, and So if it's low, that means that it's not a very risky asset. And, um, and so in, again, whoops. Lots of lots of variation in that, and it's moved on. So, how well does it? How do? How well does this tool work? I, we knew that it worked for the CCI in the Prairie Pothole region because we did that. We were pleased to see, and I'll show you a, a graph of the results. We we're pleased to see that it works pretty well on average. Um, it's often a useful tool, but there's huge variation. So those elasticities, there, the, these columns. Uh, some of them, the minimum is, is almost zero. So in some cases, you, you really don't have to lose much um, expected return at all in order to reduce your standard deviation. Uh, there are a few cases, though, where it's quite large. And maybe this is easier to see. I know you can't read. The, the, those are names of the different conservation goals. Um, but so generally these elasticities are pretty low which is good you know less than 30 percent there's just a few up here that are that are pretty high um, I'm going to point out this is the Bachman sparrow the Bachman there are a couple of them that just don't work at all and the Bachman sparrow is one of them so that's the edge elasticity um, this is the 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 D metric the distance between the simple portfolio and the efficient frontier um, so uh, a high number means there's a big percentage difference between the efficient frontier and the simple portfolio. And in general, um, for most of these, the, simple, the, the efficient frontier is a lot higher than the simple portfolio, except for the Bachman Sparrow. And that's because, uh, uh, frankly, it's just hard to diversify risk for that guy. So nothing works. <laughs> the efficient frontier isn't very good. Simple port, uh, diversification doesn't work very well. None of it's good. OK. So when does portfolio analysis work best? So we've seen that it works well for lots of these problems. Um, and we, we saw that the problems are diverse. What we find is that um, we have High cost, those ADAs, those elasticities, that's the cost of re reducing risk. Those are high if you have high exceptionalism, the first two rows. So very uh, strong correlations between the elasticities and especially how exceptional that best asset is. Um, we, we also find, these, these, this is consistent with our hypothesis, so this is good, that when you have a lot of negative correlations between assets, then costs of reducing risk is lower. And that's what we thought, and that's what we find, so that's good. 
And we find at least for the edge elasticity that if you have um, some, some parts of the landscape that themselves are pretty low risk, that, that low coefficient of variation, that um, that, that can help. OK. So conclusions. This tool can be helpful. So we've done this for conservation, but you could do it for all kinds of environmental investments where you're just trying to decide where to put something in a landscape, and there's uncertainty about driven by climate change or migration or whatever. There's uncertainty about where the best place in the future is going to be. So um, low cost risk reduction is usually possible. And usually, it's much better than what you can get if you just use simple diversification and spread your investment around the landscape. Um, we find that the presence of a close second, so another asset that's almost as good as the best one, seesaws things that vary opposite each other and low risk options can reduce the cost of diversification. Um, and I guess I didn't talk about this so much, but if you have a lot of assets that happen to be negatively correlated with each other, actually, then the simple portfolio works pretty well because you can accidentally, without thinking about it too hard, take advantage of, of that source of diversification of risk. So um, economists have these useful tools for studying conservation uncert under uncertainty. There's a lot more to be done. So we're working right now on a method and in, in intuition for doing this when you have multiple objectives uh, that you don't necessarily want to combine into one thing. And we're also looking at portfolio design when one investment could be to take some of your money and instead of just buying more land, using it to reduce the harmful effect of climate change on the thing that you're protecting. With stocks and bonds, you're not supposed to be able, you know, you just buy it and then you wait and see. So unless you're engaging in illegal insider trading, you're not supposed to be able to, to alter the returns on the things that you invest in. But that's not true of things like conservation. So you could buy some land, and then you could do stuff to it to try to uh, adapt to climate change and, and, and make the effects of it less harmful. So we're working on that, too. Well, thank you. I think that's about 20 minutes. All right, so if we could have the other two speakers back, please. Maybe turn the lights up a little bit. And so Jenny, I think, is here to bring the microphone around. Are there questions for our speakers? Thanks. This is just a quick one to Don. It, it has water use of efficiency, as you're looking at there, been tracked over time for individual crops? And, and if so, has it improved over time due, due to genetic gains? And, and where would that analysis or database be? I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, um, I know, Lisa, did you look at that in your soybean study? Oh, that's right, because, for instance, uh, Lisa did a, a common garden experiment with soybeans that were released over a 40- or 50-year period. And, sh and she discovered that while photosynthetic performance went up and yield went up, it, it happened at the cost of water use efficiency because they opened their stomates more to take in more CO2. Um, I don't know if a similar study has been done in maize or not. Uh, another question for Don and then one for Max. Um, uh, Don, so many studies, especially those done by economists, it seems, um, of climate change impacts will show two sets of results, one without CO2 effects, one with CO2 effects. And um, I find that very troubling. <laughs> I mean, um, I think often it's because the effects with, C with CO2 in there are not as dramatic. People are looking for drama. Um, are there, how do you feel about that? Um, are, are there other things we should leave out <laughs> as sensitivity analyses, or do you think this is, is misleading? Um, I'm just surprised how often that is done. 
uh, and sometimes major studies will be presented just omitting those altogether. Um, is, is it really the case that there is that much uncertainty about whether such effects are present? I mean, you seem to show that they are. I'm, I'm wondering whether you've seen that same thing and whether it bothers you. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the reasons is that it's, it's difficult to do experimentally. And so there is, you know, just a few functioning phase sites in the world. Um, you know, none of them have been in the tropics. And so to actually get at it experimentally, um, it's, it's expensive to do. Um, and it's been very confined in terms of um, the various conditions that have been done in. And so in order to do it, I think many times you'd have to do it by modeling. You'd have to extrapolate, um, you know, from the few studies that, you know, that have been done in the field. Lots and lots of chamber studies, but in many cases in the chamber studies, the chamber effect is as big as the treatment effect. And so, and so I, think it, I think it can be misleading, you know, absolutely, but I think there's a reason for it. Okay. Uh, Max, um, 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 thanks for both your presentations. I enjoyed them very much. Um, I was glad, Max, that you were going beyond the traditional staple crops in your analysis. I think that really is important. You're showing that that, that is important. I wanted to channel Keith Fugley for a moment and argue that not only should we not just be obsessing about kind of yields of staple grains, but we should be thinking more broadly and not just about crops, but all of agriculture. And we should think about more than yields. We should think about overall productivity, or what economists say, TFP, total factor productivity. Factor in all the inputs. Because if you're getting higher yields from uh, more intensification, that's not particularly great. So we want to do more with less. That's the sustainability challenge. To do more with less, um, we need productivity growth, overall productivity growth, multi-factor TFP. I'm looking at Keith Fugley's results from a chapter a few years ago. Um, he's comparing growth rates from 1971 to 1990 and 1990 to 2010, essentially. And he indeed, he shows that cereal yield growth, this is globally, yeah, uh, not quite half, but it's much slower um, in the second period, so a slowing. But agricultural output overall per area has actually accelerated a bit, and that's because of this diversification, moving maybe to higher value crops, even fruits and vegetables. Agricultural output per unit labor, another, you know, we don't want everyone having to work in agriculture. That's almost twice as rapid in the more recent period, and total factor productivity more than twice as rapid in the later period. So I would argue that instead of worrying about this, I'd say, great job, Don and others working <laughs> in the experiment stations. Um, we're boosting productivity of agriculture overall, and great job to the farmers who are innovating. Um, I take a lot of heart in that accelerated total factor productivity growth. So you know, if we just worry about land, what about water? If we worry about land and water, what about fertilizer and labor? So I think we have to look about all of those. We need to be much more comprehensive when we're thinking about sustainability, which is the theme here. And, I, and I, this obsession with corn yields, which you know <laughs> all of us are subject to because that's where the data is, I think it's misleading. And at a global scale, it's actually pointing us in the wrong direction. Uh, there's been an acceleration of productivity growth viewed in the large. So I, I, I never disagree with Tom Hurdle. Uh, so I, I fully, fully agree uh, with, with everything uh, you've said. Uh, pet peeve of mine, and I talk about this to MBAs who want to hear about, you know, iPhones and the next gadget that nobody really needs, but people think they need. I always talk about, you know, what's the greatest sort of sector in terms of technological innovation. To me, agriculture is at the very top of that, that list. It's not as attractive as iPhones. So uh, the idea here is, A, this focus on yield is, is, is not misplaced, but I think yield is drastically overemphasized. We underemphasize goods that from a caloric point of view are incredibly important in certain areas of the world, and we know nothing uh, about their climate response outside of sort of experimental fields. But if you add the farmer in there, what happens in, in, in real world uh, settings? Uh, I think the reason we don't do as much of, of what you, you want the literature to do is this obsession with uh, causal 
inference, right? So we're all in this world where we want random variation and some exogenous variable that gives us well-identified causal uh, parameters. And doing that in sort of ho holistic TFP type of way, it, I, I don't think it can really be done, certainly not at a sort of country or, or, or global scale. So I think we're, as a literature, overemphasizing uh, certain crops and underemphasizing the important aspects of, of research based on a current uh, technique du jour, uh, which I think is going to come back to, to bite us. Uh, so I, I, I've not directly answered your question, but giving you my opinion uh, on, the, on the topic. Um, this is for Amy. Um, Amy, thank you for the very interesting talk, and I even enjoyed the equations. So. But um, what I wanted to ask you about was whether you've had any thoughts about how we might be able to apply this approach to urban sustainability. I, is this working? Yeah, I have. Um, we haven't done any applications in urban settings, but you know, where are you going to build the bridge? Where are you going to put the road? You don't want them to be underwater. Subway stations, right? I mean, all, all this infrastructure, expensive, durable investments that you really don't want to have uh, underwater. Um, I, I, think, I think absolutely there are applications in urban settings. We don't have data um, for those applications, but if you did, Th that would be that would be a lot of fun. We should do that. Um, I got one uh, uh, small thing. I've looked a lot in the past three decades as a professional engineer at energy policy and <clears throat> what we need to do to create a sustainable, technologically advanced uh, society in terms of energy. Cross reference that with a lot of health and diet information. Um, I throw out there that I find that fossil fuels and corn both go away in that future. So what, what's your reaction to that? <laughs> what does your future look like? Is it uh, a future where we're taxing carbon at the right price and, you know, people make yeah. the socially optimal decisions? But I mean, I th there are many futures. I think somehow we have to bridge those gaps, yes, and get there. We've, we've got, um, you know, the solar, nuclear, and wind for energy, you know, and, and fossil fuels go away largely, um, not that we wouldn't need it for air travel. As far as corn goes, 40% goes to ethanol. I didn't really need that. 40% goes to feeding animals in confinement. I don't need that for health and fitness and a better diet. 20% of corn goes to what? Uh, corn syrup and corn-based plastics and things, I can get around that. So um, I appreciate all the efforts because I come from a farming uh, and coal mining background in my, my ancestry, but as a professional looking forward, these things go away in, in this better future. They, they do well, and, and I think we're seeing that happen, at least in part on the energy side, as wind and solar become cheaper. Uh, but that happened in part through government investments in, in techno you know, te technological improvement. Um, so I think what Max was getting at is that in order to help uh, that, that future is better because people are making choices that take into account the external costs of the decisions made, and that is unlikely to happen without policy. And so we, we need we need policy to help us. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. It yeah. and do you think this can happen fast enough based on the Earth overheating between now and 2100 and all the other things we've seen in this and uh, some other conferences I've been to here in the past couple of years? Um, do you think this can happen fast enough without some serious policy, which we're not going to get from current worldwide administrations? So, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're probably paying attention here. I was uh, reading the real live stream of the UN address in the back, so you don't read it over lunch. Uh, over the next three and a half or seven and a half years, it is unlikely that we're going to see drastic transformation of energy policy in the way that you're looking uh, for. Uh, I think we might see the, the reversal. California and several other states are trying to fight that trend. 
Uh, if you speak, if I speak to my energy economics friends in, in China, China announced uh, just prior to the Paris Agreement that they were going to build the biggest cap and trade system in the world by the end of this year. It seems that the number of sectors that are going to be included in that system seems to become smaller and smaller and smaller by the day. So there is a game theoretic response that if one large player doesn't want to play anymore, the other players uh, having to take costly actions that just affect them are also less likely uh, to wanting to play. Uh, combine that with a lack of storage for electrons at scale, uh, decreasing popularity of nuclear reactors. Westinghouse is getting out of the reactor building business, if I read the news correctly, uh, two days ago. Uh, we either solve the storage problem really, really quickly, or we're going back to the cheapest fuel, uh, well, not cheapest fuel, but amplest fuel available to most of the countries, which is coal. So uh, I don't want to be uh, Debbie, well, I don't know why she should be called Debbie, uh, Max Downer uh, over here. Uh, I'm not optimistic, right? There was a paper yesterday, oh, we can get to one and a half degrees. I don't buy it. Th th that's not economically uh, feasible, in my humble opinion. Do you have anything else depressing to add? To this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would I would just add a few caveats to what you said, and and they may not be important other than other than their facts. And that is, it's really only about twenty five percent of maize that goes into ethanol, and so forty percent of the grain goes in, but then about fifteen, you know, of that about. 40% um, of that comes back out as dry distiller grains and goes into um, uh, high protein, high fiber animal feed. The only other thing I would point out is the UN FAO and other organizations feel that globally the amount of animal protein actually needs to go up in order, uh, in order to sustain uh, diets for people across the globe. That doesn't mean that it, that it needs to be corn fed by any means, but it, it does mean that livestock production uh, for uh, equitable nutrition over the globe needs to go up and not down. Or fake meat. That's where all the VC capital in California is going right now is fake protein. Yeah, test tube grown hamburgers. If nobody else has a question, I have a question for one of the panelists. Anybody else have a question? So. May I ask you a carbon fertilization question? So I'm guilty of this, you know, let's just leave out carbon fertilization because I don't know how to do it. If you're running these observational studies where you're looking at temperature response and precipitation or VPD response of, of different crops, and you want to bound, you know, how much of this is possibly offset by carbon fertilization, a lot of what I see people do is they take these open top chamber studies, you know, do some back of the envelope calculation and move the effects in the, the opposite way. So what I thought I heard you say is that there is there are effects of the, the open chamber itself that don't mimic what happens in real field. So is that the wrong way to go? Should we not be doing this? I think that there's a lot of value that can be learned from open top chambers. Um, but in open top chambers, because you're you know, trying to you know, trying to conserve CO2, uh, what happens is the humidity goes up, light intensity goes down, um, the microenvironment changes in terms of wind speed, and all these things are um, very important variables in, in the field. Um, and so uh, the other thing that I would say is that um, a lot of the things that you would like to know really are physics. And so, uh, and it's pretty well understood, photosynthetic theory is pretty well understood. And so a lot of this can be modeled and those models have been pretty well validated. And that's a way that really need to go about a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, please join me in thanking these speakers for their three excellent talks.